Now that House of the Dragon has introduced us all to Rhaenyra Targaryen, Alicent Hightower, and their children, like Aegon and Jaceris, it is a good time to discuss who is the rightful heir to King Viserys' throne. Is it Viserys' eldest child Rhaenyra, like the king himself has decreed? Or is it Viserys' eldest son Aegon, like Alicent, Otto, and many lords of the realm would prefer? In this video, I'll explain the vast, depressing grey area, more like a grey planet, that are the laws of succession in Westeros as well as which character, Rhaenyra or Aegon, would be best suited to rule the realm of Westeros. And I'll preface this video by saying there is obviously not an objective, correct answer to who should be the heir. That's why the Dance of the Dragon Civil War happens, and that's why fans of House of the Dragon can choose between Rhaenyra's Team Black or Aegon's Team Green. Or, if you don't want to choose a side, and just want to sit back and watch the chaos from Oblivion, join me on Team Breakbones. Sometimes a person has to choose. Oh wait. What's that, Stannis? I have to choose? Sometimes the world forces his hand. I don't want to choose. So the choosing sides that made everything so horrible. Listen to your daughter, Stannis the Menace. I choose no one but you. First, let's review the situation of the Targaryen crown by this time in history, about 120 AC. The Targaryen family has ruled Westeros with an absolute monarchy, meaning the king has absolute power over his subjects, without any obligation to a constitution, for over a century. The first king, Aegon, had a worrying succession crisis right off the bat. He got married to two women, his sisters, in his early 20s. It wasn't until he was 34, about five years after his conquest was done, that his first son Aenys was born to his sister Rhaenys. A few years later, Maegor was born to Visenya. So Aegon went a long time without a successor, but then all agreed that Aenys, the firstborn son, was the rightful heir. But once he and his wife Alyssa Valerion had a child, a daughter named Rhaena, Aegon's sister Visenya argued that her son Maegor should still be second in line to the throne after Aenys, not Rhaena. Aegon could have codified and exacted a specific detailed law of royal succession, but he did not. With a reign in such infancy, it would have been a good idea or else it might lead to generations of confusion and arguing and a bit of civil war over who should be the heir, or the heir's heir. Westeros is dominated by Andalic custom, ever since the Andals invaded between two and six thousand years before the story begins. Of course, traditions of the First Men and the Rhoynar are still kept in the North and Dorne respectively, but ever since Aegon the Conqueror unified the kingdoms, Andal tradition is widespread across the single kingdom of Westeros. Westeros practices agnatic-cognatic primogeniture as their system of inheritance. What this means is that the eldest living son inherits, then his son would come after him. However, if that first son and heir should die, his daughters would come before the sons of the second son. For example, we can look at House Karstark in the Game of Thrones books. Rickard Karstark, the lord that Rob beheads, is lord of Carhold. He has three sons, Herion, Eddard, and Torin, and then a daughter, Alice. All three of his sons are either killed or captured during the War of the Five Kings, fighting for Robb Stark. So does Alice become Lady of Carhold, or does Rickard's younger brother, Alice's uncle Arnolf, become Lord of Carhold instead? Well, in A Dance with Dragons, Arnolf schemes to try to forcibly marry Alice to his son Cregan and take charge of Carhold that way. This tells us that Alice was expected to be the next ruler, but her uncle tried to usurp her power. So that's the male preference but daughters come before uncles system of succession in most of Westeros. But while this is the most common, you can definitely find examples of uncles coming before daughters in Westerosi history. It's just not consistent. House Targaryen practices some Valyrian exceptionalism though, meaning that they place themselves above the laws of common Andals or First Men, given their divine right to rule from their dragon blood. So Targaryens rationalize their incestuous marriages that way and they also rationalize their inconsistent inheritance practices. The best example of this pertaining to the story of House of the Dragon is of Old King Jaehaerys Targaryen, who we saw in the opening scene during the Great Council of 101. The Great Council was actually Jaehaerys' second succession crisis. The first came when his eldest son and heir, Aemon, died on Tarth. Aemon was married to Jocelyn Baratheon, and they had one child, a daughter and dragon rider named Rhaenys. By the custom of the Andals, Rhaeny should become the new heir. If the eldest son has no sons of his own, his daughter can inherit. However, King Jaehaerys decided against this. He instead named his second son, Aemon's younger brother Balon, as the new heir instead of his niece Rhaenys. 
Westeros had never had a ruling queen, and Jaehaerys thought Balon was a better choice, especially since he and his sister wife Alyssa already had two sons, Viserys and Daemon. A few years later, at the Great Council, King Jaehaerys doubled down on this decision of absolute male preference once Balon died. Of course, the lords could have voted for Rhaenys, but it was always unlikely, and Jaehaerys knew that. And if he wanted Rhaenys to be his heir, he had two chances to name her. Clearly, King Jaehaerys set the precedent for the Targaryen royal family of absolutism, meaning that the king is not bound by law or custom, and can thus name whoever he wants as his heir. This isn't to say that women cannot rule their father's lands elsewhere in Westeros, however. We actually hear mention of one thanks to Daemon in episode 5. Lady Jane Arryn rules the Vale herself. Lady Jane's father and all her older brothers were killed by mountain clansmen when she was a young girl. The canon gets a bit cloudy here, but there is reason to believe that Jane's father was the eldest son of Lord Roderick Arryn, though it isn't explicitly stated. Roderick Arryn had other sons, meaning Lady Jane has uncles, and we know she was contested by her cousin Arnold Arryn. This supports the idea that the Veil, vale, being Andals, follow agnatic cognatic primogeniture, as Jane inherited the Eyrie as her father's only child, instead of her father's younger brother or her cousin. That's all the information I can give on the laws of succession in Westeros. In general, the lords of the realm follow Andal tradition, but the Targaryen kings largely operate on their own terms. They are fickle, like many elements of this story. So, by Andal tradition, Viserys should never have been king, and Rhaenys should be queen. Ignoring that, but still following Andal tradition, Viserys' sons Aegon and Aemond would come before Rhaenyra, who would inherit only above Helena. However, Viserys makes a royal decree, like Jaehaerys did for Balon, that Rhaenyra will be his heir. And since the Targaryens are the law, we cannot say that this is invalid. So, Rhaenyra, for now, is the true heir. But next, let's talk about bastards and Rhaenyra's children. Westeros is full of harsh societal norms. Bastards are looked down upon everywhere except Dorne. There is an almost folklore type of stigma in Westeros that bastards are born of lust and weakness and are all wanton and treacherous by nature. Jon Snow experiences his fair share of prejudice from Alistair Thorne. And as the bastard son of Ned Stark, he wasn't allowed certain privileges that his half-siblings had. He couldn't sit and eat with them at the feast when King Robert Baratheon visited the north. He had to sit in the back of the hall. Bastards can rise high though. Jon Snow becomes Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, and there have been two bastard-born Lord Commanders of the Kingsguard, Robert Flowers and Addison Hill, bastards from the Reach and Westerlands respectively. Also, some bastards are acknowledged by their fathers, and raised in castles like Jon was, if those fathers are lords. King Robert acknowledged his bastard son Edric Storm, so Edric was sent to Storm's End to be raised there in nicer conditions. Even further, some bastards are legitimized by royal decree. This is typically only done when a lord finds himself lacking a true-born heir. But only the king can legitimize a bastard. A lord cannot legitimize his own bastard. Aegon IV, the Unworthy, legitimized all of his bastard children as he was dying, and this caused generations of civil war in Westeros, known as the Blackfyre Rebellions. Regarding a bastard's rights and inheritance, there are no clear-cut answers, since, according to George R. R. Martin, medieval Europe was not clear-cut either. Most things were decided on a case-by-case -case basis. In House of the Dragon, the fact is that Rhaenyra, even though she is the rightful heir to the throne thanks to Viserys' decree, has three bastard sons by Harwin Strong, which she tries to pass off as true-born Targaryen Valerion heirs, Jaehaerys, Lucerys, and Joffrey. They are an interesting case, though, since they are not seen as bastards. We as viewers know they're bastards, and obviously Rhaenyra and Laenor know, and Alicent and her side of the court suspect it, but officially, to the outside eye, those three kids are not bastards. They are Valerions. There is an argument among some fans of the show that if Rhaenyra simply legitimized her sons, then the succession would be cleared up. That's impossible though, since Rhaenyra won't admit they are bastards, and Viserys is either too blind or too unwilling to admit it as well. Only the king can legitimize a bastard, and this king won't recognize that they are bastards. And if Viserys did recognize there are bastards, he would have to either legitimize them, showing weakness in his family, or create a law saying that bastard sons can inherit. That would cause insane ripples in the kingdom if you think about how many lords had older brothers who were bastards that could take their place. This gray area is a large part in what causes the Dance of the Dragons civil war. 
Alice and Hightower would have us believe that Rhaenyra's treachery and extramarital procreation is so immoral and such an affront to her faith that her son Aegon must be named the heir, simply in the name of decency. Of course, that isn't why Alison does what she does. She, thanks to her father Otto Hightower, has developed a deep mistrust of her former best friend Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra lied to her all those years ago about losing her virginity, causing her father to lose his job as Hand of the King, and now she's lying to the realm about her three sons. Alicent has it in her head that if Rhaenyra were to ascend the throne, she would murder Aegon and Aemond so they could not rival her claim. This is some pretty serious fear-mongering, and she uses this idea to manipulate Aegon into opposing Rhaenyra in the first place, since he was never interested in being the king until he thought his half-sister would murder him. Alicent thinks that a bastard child born of love, like Jaceris, is somehow more immoral to be king than a true-born rapist, like Aegon. Aegon is a douchey, rapey teenager for now, but his story is a tragic one. He was born in a pile of toxicity, his mother hates his half-sister, and everyone is going to scheme to make him rival Rhaenyra even though he had no interest in that. He's been manipulated by the Greens to act as a device to rid Rhaenyra of her inheritance, and he doesn't know any better. He was set up to be the villain from birth, and seemingly received none of the love and attention that Jace and Luke received from Rhaenyra despite their bastardy. That's why Aegon is the way he is, and that's why Jace is a kind, well-adjusted young man. Rhaenyra is the legal heir by a royal decree. You can't really dispute that. You can, however, argue that Aegon should replace Rhaenyra as the heir because of her bastard sons. Passing them off as trueborn is treason, as she's lying to the king about his own grandchildren. There is one big difference here, though, from Cersei Lannister's situation in Game of Thrones. Cersei and Jaime's bastards, Joffrey, Tommen, and Marcella, were not related to King Robert at all. They had zero Baratheon blood. Rhaenyra's bastards are still half Targaryen. Jaceris, if he became the heir to Queen Rhaenyra, has the Queen's DNA, unlike King Joffrey, who was Lannister through and through. Once again, this adds another heap of grey into the already huge grey area. So Alicent and Otto and Aegon have a point. Why should Rhaenyra be allowed to remain Viserys' heir? when she has committed treason by tricking him into believing that her sons are true-born. But, there is no law saying that an heir must be disinherited if their own children are bastards. Targaryens are the law, and Viserys is too weak and negligent to see that anything is wrong with his family. His lack of anchoring his own succession is ultimately what causes the war. He has absolute power to do whatever he thinks is best for his dynasty, and ultimately, he fails. Now that we've established that Rhaenyra is the legal heir by royal decree, but has also committed some light treason in lying about her bastard sons, let's discuss who would actually make for the better monarch. There is no right answer, so that's why fans of the show can debate between Rhaenyra and Aegon. Logical reasons can be made for either, which I have already laid out. Essentially, Rhaenyra's supporters would say that she should become queen since Viserys decreed it, and her sons being bastards just doesn't matter that much since they'll never officially be recognized as bastards, and at least they are half Targaryen. And Aegon supporters would say that Rhaenyra's treason is enough to remove her status as heir, or that the Andal custom of agnatic cognatic primogeniture should be adhered to not just by the lords of the realm, but by the royal family as well, meaning the eldest son should inherit. Let's start with Rhaenyra. Would she make a good queen? She is confident and strong, a true Valyrian dragon lord traits which place her above someone like her weaker-willed father, Viserys. She is mature and fair, and even diplomatic, as her offer to marry her son Jace to Alicent's daughter Helena was most judicious. She is also arrogant and treasonous. She believed herself to be above tradition and duty when Viserys wanted her to find a husband. She sexually gallivanted around King's Landing with her uncle Damon, and then coerced Sir Christian Cole to soil his white cloak for her. When she married a man not of her choosing, she schemed with him to practice adultery, resulting in her bastard sons, who she intends to sit the throne after her. She may be a good and fair ruler, but she has a rocky personal life. Aegon is also confident and strong, a true dragon lord. We haven't seen much of his diplomacy or maturity since he's still a young man, but we have seen him act age-appropriately douchey. He is also sympathetic in the fact that he's been manipulated into wanting to oppose Rhaenyra. It was never his idea. He has an admirable brotherly bond with Aemond, but isn't very nice to either him or his sister wife, Helena. The worst of Aegon, however, is far worse than Rhaenyra. He sexually assaulted a serving girl in the Red Keep, 
and who knows how many other girls he did the same to. He made unwanted advances to Princess Bela right in front of Jaceris. He has no respect for anyone in his family, save perhaps his brother Amond, and doesn't hesitate to commit violence to Jace and Luke. From what we've seen so far, Aegon would probably be a fairly hands-off, neither cruel nor kind king, somewhat like Robert Baratheon. However, Aegon clearly is not a good person, and war against your half-sister, who you've been gaslit into believing will want to murder you one day, can definitely make you a worse king. The jury's still out on Aegon, but as far as humanity and just being a good person goes, Rhaenyra wins for now. They both ride dragons. Rhaenyra has Cyrax, and Aegon has Sunfire. Each of their teams has dragon power as well. Rhaenyra's husband Daemon rides Caraxes, Rhaenys, the queen who never was, rides Maelys, and Rhaenyra's children all have young dragons. Vermax for Jace, Arax for Luke, and eventually Joffrey will ride Taraxes. On the other side, Aegon's brother Aemond rides the largest living dragon, Vagar. Their sister Helena rides Streamfire, and both the Blacks and the Greens will add other dragon riders as the war progresses. I just don't want to spoil them right now. As far as Bannerman support, both sides have great allies. The Valerions, with their rich and powerful fleet, back Rhaenyra, but the equally powerful and influential Hightowers back Aegon. Other great houses of the realm will pick sides and waver back and forth, but the greens and the blacks are relatively evenly matched. It really comes down to who can kill the most family members with their flying reptilian sky nukes, unfortunately. What the Targaryens really need is a codified succession law, which favors either absolutism, in which every king or queen can name their own heir, or Andalic custom, in which the eldest trueborn son is the heir. Even if he only has daughters, then the daughter can come before his younger brother. They just need a set in stone law so that these inheritance crises never happen again, and everyone knows at all times who the heir is. Alas, that would require competent administration, with no interruption of that law. In a monarchy form of government, you're bound to end up with an insanely horrible king sooner or later, who may just choose to ignore whatever laws their predecessors created. So, I've essentially just argued for the abolishment of the monarchy. That makes for a boring story though. And actually wait, who has the best story? Rhaenyra or Aegon? Stories. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Forget succession laws, the more interesting character deserves to sit on the Iron Throne. Let me know in the comments which team you support for now, the Greens or the Blacks, or if you just want to enjoy the chaos like me. Team Small Folk. Lastly, I want to say thank you for getting the channel to 4,000 subscribers and 1 million channel views. It means a lot. Thanks for watching.